There is a 900 plus acre farm ranch that I hunt 10 to 15 minutes outside of Big Rapids, Michigan College Town, about 25,000 residents. I've known for years about the existence of Sasquatch. I have been an avid archery hunter for years and loved spending hours in the woods, scouting and setting up new stands to hunt in the fall. On occasions, my sixth sense would go into overdrive while out scouting certain sections of this property. I would dismiss it as an overactive imagination and carry on with my mission. Multiple times while on stand, I would hear loud tree knocks from various points that surrounded me. I never thought too much into them as I would just dismiss those as natural sounds due to limbs clanking, banging, or busting. I would also notice rank and stagnant odors that would overwhelm my area from time to time. Again, I'd also dismiss these foul smells as possible black bear odors, as I've heard they stink and are quite abundant in our area. On one occasion, while walking into my stand, I heard what sounded like a rock skipping through the treetops, hitting up high and falling to the ground. I glanced in the general direction of the sound and didn't see anything. As I continued walking, I heard the same sound again that this time it was closer, and as I looked towards the sound, I caught the movement of a two to three inch diameter rock falling out of the tree, in which it had just impacted. I walked up to the rock, picked it up, and stared up the tree, saying to myself, what the hell are the squirrels carrying these big rocks up the trees? You see the pattern here. Weird happens, and I dismiss it as I'm 45 years young, and don't want to believe I have to deal with a Sasquatch or any other paranormal entity on the land on which I hunt. But the last incident finally got my attention, and I now acknowledge the fact that I could possibly be dealing with one of these beings. My son and I were heading out of the woods in a well-lit full moon night about an hour after dark. No flashlights needed. We had a one-half-mile walk back to our vehicle, up this easily traversable stretch bottom that laid at the foot of large rolling hardwood hills and deep-cutting ravines that extended to the creek's edge. We had sat pretty close in proximity to one another and had met up at dark to walk out together. Keep in mind that this is the same area that I've experienced tree knocks, rocks being thrown, and smells that could curl your toenails. We had covered the half-mile hike back to our origins, and we're now standing outside of our vehicle offloading our gear into the back seat. I reached into the car and fired the engine while still standing outside of it as to shed some ambient light on our surrounding. I turned my back to the car. It was in the process of evacuating my bladder when I heard what I thought was my son cranking the radio up in the car as loud as he could. I wheeled my head over to my over my shoulders to look at him, and when I did, I locked eyes with my son, who stood on the other side of the car. I saw the fear in his eyes as he stood with his jaw open wide. He had not entered the car and turned up the radio. It was a scream, yell that had radiated from the bottom of which we had just exited minutes before. The loud bellowing lasted ten or fifteen seconds and was as loud as any music concert I've ever attended. Keep in mind, I'm six foot, 230 pounds. My son, six foot two and about 260, were both armed with bows and knives, and I had a 45 XDS Springfield on my side. My son and I jumped into the car, slammed the door shut, and peeled out like Bo and Luke, Duke being chased by Roscoe P., Coltrane and Boss Hog as dirt flew from our tires all the way out to the paved road. Normally, we travel this half-dirt two-track at about 10 miles per hour. That night, we may or may not have hit 50 miles per hour. We anxiously and excitedly talked about our experience together all the way back home. We've spent hundreds upon hundreds of hours in the woods and have hunted almost everything possible to hunt in our area. We have never heard any form of vocalization like this before. We rarely hunt this property anymore and never alone. As a matter of fact, the last time I sat in this area was two rifle seasons ago, and I heard a larger tree fall over on a windless afternoon. I retreated back to the truck and basically called it quits for the day.
I can still feel the icy grip of fear clawing at my heart every time I think back to that ill-fated hunting trip in the cursed woods of Kentucky. It was a day that would forever haunt my dreams, a day when my faith in the known world was shattered and the boundaries of reality were pushed to their limits. The woods in Kentucky had always held a sinister reputation among hunters and locals. They spoke of strange happenings, eerie sounds, and an overwhelming sense of dread that seemed to permeate the very air. But for a group of seasoned hunters like us, stories of curses and ghost stories were nothing but campfire entertainment. Until that day, we were a group of five, including me, Jake, the unofficial leader of our little expedition, and my lifelong friends, Mike, Tom, Sarah, and Mark. We had ventured deep into the heart of the supposedly cursed reserve, seeking the thrill of the hunt, and hoping to prove that the legends were nothing more than superstitions. As the sun dipped below the thick canopy of trees, casting eerie shadows upon us, we decided to split into two groups, with each group pursuing different game, deer and ducks. It was in that fateful decision that our nightmare began. My group consisted of Mike, Tom, and me. We ventured deeper into the woods, our rifles at the ready, scanning the surroundings for any sign of prey. The air was thick with tension, and an eerie silence hung around us. Then, as we entered a small clearing, something caught our attention. It was a presence, a feeling of being watched that sent shivers down my spine. I exchanged nervous glances with Mike and Tom, and we silently decided to investigate. Our eyes widened in horror as we saw it, an unknown predator, a monstrous creature that defied all logic and explanation. It had to be at least nine feet tall, with shoulders as wide as four feet. Its stringy hair did little to conceal the bulging muscles beneath, which flexed with each movement. Its thighs were as round as tree trunks, and it had hardly a neck to speak of, with a head that tapered into a cone-like shape. Its long arm swung menacingly by its side. I would describe it as a half-gorilla and half-neanderthal, man. Type animal, a grotesque amalgamation of the prehistoric and the otherworldly. We were paralyzed by fear, unable to comprehend the monstrous being before us. Our rifles were clenched tightly in trembling hands, ready to fire, but the creature seemed to sense our presence. Its head turned slowly in our direction, and its eyes, dark and soulless, met ours. Time stood still as a shiver of dread washed over us, in that heart. Pounding moment, the creature began to run, its massive form moving gracefully on two legs. Panic overtook us, and we opened fire, but our shots missed their mark as we fired blindly in sheer terror. The creature showed no signs of injury and the deafening roar of the gunshots only seemed to fuel its relentless pursuit. In our desperation, we abandoned our rifles, the very tools of our trade, and ran for our lives. The woods, once familiar and inviting, had transformed into a labyrinth of shadows and horrors. We pushed through thick underbrush, our hearts pounding in our chests, our breaths ragged. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we stumbled upon another group of hunters, breathless and wild-eyed. We recounted our harrowing encounter with the unknown predator, but their skeptical expressions greeted our story. They dismissed our story as an overactive imagination or the stress of the hunt getting the better of us, but we knew what we had seen, what we had felt deep in our bones. A creature that defied all rational explanation, a nightmare lurking in the depths of those cursed woods. I work for a city park and recreation department here in Colorado. I also serve as a district ranger for the National Park Service. I took the ranger patrolling training and love the outdoors, but I'm not a trained scientist or a tracker. I was driving home from work one evening in 2017, and it was dusk. I was heading east on United State 24, towards Berthout Falls. 
There is a turnoff located before you get right to the falls that goes to a park where you can camp called Rainbow Park. I was driving down the turnoff, and when I reached the bottom of the road, I saw this huge thing looking at me. I wasn't sure what it was at first, but I really thought it was a bear. But then I saw wings and saw that this might be some sort of mountain lion creature with wings. At least that's what it looked like. So I'm thinking it's a flying mountain lion, totally confused because my brain cannot process this. It does not make any sense. Then it jumps off the ground and takes off into the air. Not only was this amazing to see, but it was also mind-numbing. It was huge and had a very large body and a wingspan far larger than my truck. The body was more like a mix between a human and a lion, and the head looked more like a large cat. I thought maybe it was injured, or I'm not sure what it was doing. I could see, though, that its wings were very strange, also very alien, looking to any kind of bird we have here on Earth. I mean, these are just my guesses. I took off into the woods, drove up the road to the park, got out of my truck, still shocked at my sighting, and everything around me was dead silent. I noticed right away it was colder than usual, and things did not feel right. I had a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I just tried to shake it off as best I could, and things seemed to stop for the time being. Later on, I went back to the spot where I had my sighting, and there were huge impressions on the ground where it landed, going through the trees into the woods. I was so confused, but also scared and in awe. I've kept this a secret until now. I would love to tell everybody more about what I saw and where. I wish I could have taken photos, but it all happened so fast. As scared as I was, it honestly kind of reminded me of seeing something from Greek mythology come to life or something along those lines. I don't know what creature looks like that with wings, but man, it was something else entirely. Thank you for taking the time to read this. My name is Tom. Of course, that's not my real name, but the name for the sake of story. I was leader of the Navy SEAL team. So, we were deployed to a war-torn region of Iraq with a classified mission to eliminate a high-value target terrorist leader, not Saddam. Little did we know that our encounter with the enemy would take a terrifying turn. After meticulous planning and precise execution, we successfully infiltrated the target's heavily guarded castle. Using advanced surveillance equipment, we kept a constant eye on the live feed, ensuring that our actions were being monitored by the highest authority. With the utmost precision, we eliminated the target, fulfilling our mission objective. As the cameras captured the moment, we knew our success would be witnessed by the eyes of our nation's leaders. As the mission came to a close, we shut off the camera feed and began securing the area. Curiosity overcame me, and a strange pull drew me towards a dark and hidden basement chamber within this desert castle. With each step, an eerie silence filled the air, adding to the weight of the unknown that awaited me. As I entered the chamber, a dim light revealed in strange sight that froze me in awe. Before me stood a creature towering at least ten feet tall, its form shrouded in shadow. It possessed a humanoid shape with two long and skinny legs, arms that extended all the way to the ground and a round body. Its neck, elongated and slender, held no features of a face. Around him were human corpses, about ten of poor people. The air grew thick with a sense of malevolence, and I could feel the creature's presence suffocating me. Without warning, it lunged at me with blinding speed and brute force. The impact sent me crashing to the ground, my senses reeling from the ferocity of the attack. In the chaos of the moment, the creature vanished as swiftly as it had appeared, leaving me shaken and bewildered. Desperately, I called for backup, summoning my fellow seals to the scene. But as they arrived, confusion etched on their faces. They claimed they hadn't witnessed any creature or encountered anything out of the ordinary. Doubt clouded their expressions, and their responses only deepened the mystery. 
We combed the area, searching every nook and cranny, but there was no trace of the creature that had assaulted me. It was as if it had vanished into thin air, leaving behind only lingering questions and a chilling sense of unease. Despite the lack of evidence I knew in my bones that what I had witnessed was real, a terrifying encounter with an entity beyond comprehension. I was a beat officer for a small town in northern New Jersey. The chief of police at the time was a guy well known to me and my brothers in the force as Mr. Paranoid himself. One night I responded to a call from dispatch that there had been reports of screaming from the woods near Greenwood Lake. I arrived at the location and didn't see anything but a foul smell hung in the air. It smelled like blood, wet dog, and iron. I entered the woods on foot with my flashlight ready to catch any pranksters or anybody who was fooling around. Listening intently for any sign of life as I made my way deeper into the woods, something suddenly darted out from a clump of trees to my right, tearing off into the woods. I chased after them, or it as best I could, but there's no way I could ever catch up to them. A few weeks later, a young boy had gone missing from his family's campsite around the same location. The search party had come up empty-handed, but I knew that area was where I'd seen whatever it was that night. What I assumed was a large animal, the chief of police, during an investigation, took me aside and told me not to talk about what I saw around town. He stated that he didn't want to cause panic in the small town, so he never reported his encounter or description of what happened at Greenwood. Though we weren't able to find any missing persons matching the description, we're also unable to find the location of where this other officer believed that he himself saw a werewolf. I did see one, though claiming to be an unnamed officer who had also been on the search party for the missing boy, but they have since been let go. Five to six years ago, I found myself in the rugged wilderness of Oregon's Ochaco Mountains, pursuing my passion for archery hunting. On this particular hunting trip near Spanish Peak, Oregon, I had been tracking an elusive elk deep into a secluded canyon. As darkness cloaked the landscape, intensified by the thick clouds overhead, I realized it was time to make my way back to the road, which was about an hour's hike away. Yet an eerie feeling crept over me as if I were being trailed by an unseen presence. The night came alive with unsettling sounds, breaking sticks, rustling leaves, that sent shivers down my spine. Instinctively, I called out, stop or I'll shoot, clutching my arrows tightly, prepared to defend myself against the mysterious cryptid lurking in the darkness. To my astonishment, the source of the noise emerged from the shadows, closing the distance between us to a mere 10 to 15 feet. It mirrored my movements, halting whenever I stopped. Determined to confront this enigmatic presence, I readied an arrow, hoping for a glimpse of my pursuer. However, as I positioned myself in a small clearing, the cryptid abruptly ceased its pursuit. Perplexed yet relieved, I continued my journey towards a forested area, unaware that it had circled around the clearing, resuming its pursuit from the cover of the trees. With each cautious step enveloped by the enigmatic darkness, I felt an unseen force watching over me. There was no accompanying smell or visual confirmation of what trailed me, only an undeniable presence that sent chills down my spine. Despite the challenging circumstances, my instincts guided me along the winding road, etched in my memory from previous encounters. Without the aid of a flashlight, I relied solely on my knowledge and intuition. The entity, for reasons unknown, ceased its pursuit as I reached the road, vanishing into the shadows. Reflecting on this harrowing experience, I couldn't help but contemplate the stories surrounding Bigfoot, rumored to assist lost hunters in the wilderness. Perhaps the enigmatic cryptid had been watching over me, ensuring my safe exit from the treacherous wood. I 
I am 38 and an Army veteran trying to work as a local carpenter in Maine, the state where I have almost always lived. I've had two encounters with the creature I will soon tell you about, one that occurred when I was a teenager and actually one a couple years ago. The house I am currently living in is my father's since he now has multiple heart conditions and would have to live alone. I and my sister grew up in this house, which is in eastern Maine. Living here as a child always felt a little off, as if something was not right in a way. It's hard to describe. The house is surrounded by woods on almost all sides and sits on a dead-end road with six or seven houses down the way. We own 70 acres of dense forests that are littered with a TV trails and walking trails. I've been out on these trails over a hundred times, probably just clearing them for neighbors who we let use them and just trying to maintain them. But every time I'm out there, I feel like I'm being stalked. In this area, I nor my father have ever seen a bear, wolf, or mountain lion. Nothing really above the size of a bobcat. As a teen, I liked dressing up in military gear and going out to play war and games similar. Normally, go out with my friend Sid and Marvin, two guys who lived down the road. Sid was an older dude, around 18, who smoked and did average tough guy stuff. Marv, who I still am friends with today, we even served together until he was discharged, was more on my level. We were both pretty timid young guys who didn't really associate with most people and just enjoyed being out in the woods and chilling. Anyway, one day we'd gone out around 3 p.m. on a chilly winter evening to go play as we did most days. We all grabbed our gear, which was stuff that Sid's dad, who was a Vietnam vet, had given him. And then Sid had shared with us. This included medical kits and ammo box, grenade pouches, etc. He even gave Sid an old handgun without the magazine or ammunition. But Sid's dad still didn't allow him to take it out of the house. So after a while of walking down one of the paths, we come to one of our favorite spots, which is sort of like a clearing full of boulders and moss. At the time, it was covered in knee, deep snow. Normally, my mother would not have let us go out this far, but she wasn't there to say no since she was in New Hampshire for the holidays. We had been out there for quite a while, throwing snowballs and pretending they were grenades and blasting at each other with our sticks. It was about 5 p.m. when we were starting to gather our stuff because it was beginning to get dark. As I'm scooping up my stuff, Marv talks in a confused and worrisome tone. Hey guys, what the hell is that thing? He draws our attention to a tall, completely black creature standing on two legs, its arms dangling by its sides and dragging through the snow. From our angle at 50 or 60 meters away, we couldn't see its face, but it was walking away from us. I remember a weird tightness in my chest after realizing that I had no idea what we were looking at. Then Sid yelled out, Hey, hairball! Then the creature stopped! My chest grew even tighter and it felt like my body was frozen after I saw its abrupt stop. It slowly turned towards us. Its face had no facial features, but it looked to be plain flesh. No nose, eyes, or mouth. We were so frightened that none of us could talk. It stared at us for a couple minutes before one of us suggested the bright idea of leaving. We crept away as the sun was now really low, while one of us constantly looked back until we got out of sight. Then we bolted back to my house where we hid inside, collapsing onto the living room floor. We were silent for a moment before I broke out laughing. The others joined in. After a few seconds, Sid said, uh, Oh, guys, WTF did we just see? We tried rationalizing, but I think we all knew that we had seen something that didn't belong. The guys ended up staying the night at my place that night. We stayed up late drinking hot chocolate and every now and then stepping onto the front porch to see if it may have followed us. After a couple of days, the creature mostly disappeared from our minds. We still got together and hung out having adventures in the woods. I never told my parents about this thing that we saw because they probably would have believed me and I didn't want to go through all the trouble of explaining it to them over and over. Neither did I tell my sister because she wouldn't care and I wouldn't receive any feedback, so it was pointless.
We three also never really brought the creature up again. It was like an unspoken agreement. My second encounter transpired in roughly the same area about a mile or two from there three years ago. I had just been honorably discharged and been home with my father for no more than a month picking up odd jobs, mostly in auto and house repairs, both being skills I learned from my time overseas. It was a summer evening when I decided to head out on the trails and take a look around. After all, I haven't been out there for ages and expected the trails to be overgrown. So I took with me some basic brush clearings equipment such as a hatchet, an old machete, and some other stuff, and then set up. Sid had recently moved to Vermont, and Marv had been medically discharged a while ago, and left with a leg disability, making it hard to walk. I would have asked him to join me if not for his disability. I had made it half a mile into the main path, moving and cutting up the suspected limbs, branches, and overgrown grass as best as possible, hoping to come back tomorrow with a weed whacker to do some more work. As I got deeper, the feeling of being watched returned, the same feeling I got as a teenager when I was out there. And I began noticing that the dense growth was getting thinner, and more and more limbs were smashed or pushed out of the way, as well the tall grass and overgrowth were no longer in the way. In fact, the trail became almost cleared and looked like it used to. I was shocked that somebody cared enough to come out here and clear all this. But as I thought on it more, I remembered that the entrance hadn't been groomed. So how did they get in? I began looking closely at the ground, noticing feet or paw prints I'd never seen before. I crouched down to gain a better look. The printed had three pointy toes, each about six inches long, and were spaced about three feet apart in sets of two. I didn't recognize these and decided to just follow them a little further to check it out. About a quarter of a mile later, I see this creature, my second encounter, and so far my last time. It was walking from the side of the path at a slow pace, not acknowledging my presence. Not yet, at least. It slowly crossed the path and continued into the woods, and after a minute I walked up to the area where he had entered, and there it was strolling or creeping into the woods, still not noticing me. I could hear his arms dragging across the forest floor, and his fur coat still looked silky black, yet I wanted to see its face again, but not to the point where I would risk being spotted. So I slowly reached for my phone, only to realize that it was in the front pocket of my backpack, as I didn't want to lose it while working. I pulled the bag from my shoulders and placed it in front of me and began unzipping the pocket. But as I did, the creature stopped, as he had done the last time. Oh, Lord Jesus, I thought, as I froze and my chest tightened. It began to turn. Its fleshy face began staring back at me. I tightened the grip on the hatchet I had in hand, and now that I think about it, that probably wouldn't have done much to the eight-foot behemoth, now that I think about it. We both stared motionless for what felt like hours. In reality, I had no idea how long we had been there. I eventually stood up with my legs feeling numb. I backed away until it was out of sight, and then took off as fast as I could go. As I was running, I was sure I heard a violent scream from behind me, but I wasn't going to turn to look. Long story short, I haven't been back in those woods for three years and don't plan on it either. I know this may sound over-exaggerated or fake like something from a children's book, but I know what I saw, and Marvin knows what he saw. I will never forget this. I was living in a travel trailer for a time on my sister's property, about three acres or so, circa the summer of 2019. The house was in the front, on half the property, and I was in the wild lands backfield behind the backyard. This was near Redding, California, in the Sacramento River. Only several blocks away, basically in the country and county, outside of town, but quite a few residences up and down. The streets around the area on big lots. I don't remember what made me open the door and stick my head out to look around one late evening, but something caused me to do it, maybe some noise. 
As I was looking around, I heard what sounded like several very slow footsteps in dry brush, going crack, snap, crack, like someone was walking away slowly, kind of being stealthy. I then realized it was right there, about 15 feet away, maybe on this side of the, see, through wire fence, but it could have been right on the other side of the neighbor's property back section. So I was looking, waiting to see some animal wildlife or something, but there was nothing. It was dark, but I had my outside trailer light on, and there was some good moonlight. If there was something there, I should have been able to see it. Then I heard someone run off into the backfield. It had to be a very large, if not huge, heavy animal, like a horse. It was bump, 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 bump. I was surprised it didn't shake the ground or trailer. But not a four-legged horse, like clippity-clop. It was an obvious two-legged run, probably with a very long stride. And then it was gone. But I saw nothing like it was invisible. I went back in and locked my door, and nothing else happened. I looked around the next day for some footprints, but didn't find any. I can only think that it must have been a Bigfoot. Is it possible that it was cloaked or invisible? Okay, so a few years ago, maybe like two or three, I was out walking out in the woods behind my grandmother's house, and I had a really bad feeling like I was being watched and heard something following behind me. Deer season was just about to start, so I thought nothing about it because I thought it might be a deer. Deer tend to hang out in the woods, so it wasn't much of a worry. I was about to head back through the trees and found a tree that I didn't feel particularly comfortable being near, as I had picked up bad vibes, but I was being stupid and I looked around the tree, and it had like really big and strange claw marks in and on the bark of it. There was also some bones from what I'm guessing was a canine when I had made it out of the woods. I had went inside the house. I don't really remember how I got there, and my grandmother, and why I had been bleeding, Note that I always carry a knife on me, so I went into the bathroom to patch it up. That was the end of that interaction. Something of the same sort had happened a few months later when I was visiting my aunt. I had also decided to explore the woods near her place, and I had caught a glimpse of a really tall figure covered in fur. I had taken up my photo to take a picture of it and zoomed in to get a better look at it and noticed it was covered in leaves and a little bit of blood. It had very large antlers, so I went back to her house and researched about it. Both settings of the woods were both more so marshy, so I decided to just call the Wendigo Marsh. So now I have a Wendigo that lives out behind my grandparents' house. I had also wound up hearing a call and screaming when I was walking. My significant other and I used to manage a fly and fishing resort outpost in very far northwestern Ontario. We did this for a few years in the summers. We would live on an island from late April, early May until mid-October on a lake that had no road, rail access at all. There was also no phone service, no internet, no TV, no electric grid, no indoor plumbing, etc., this shit was as remote as it gets, and we'd live it for seven months out of our year. Now, typically, the planes that get people in and out of there are little Cessnas and 50-year-old de Havilland beavers and otters, cubs slash super cubs and the like. Very old, loud planes that you can hear coming miles away fly low, 5,000 feet typically, and don't fly past sundown. So this one night, me and significant other are outside having before bed smoke, and Dog is out with us. We're alone this week on the lake as there's no guests on the lake at all, meaning there's no other humans for about 500 kilometers in any direction from us. It's about 12 a.m., pitch black, and suddenly we see this light come over the trees of our island. But something's off about it. It's not a shooting star or an airplane. That's apparent. It moves weirdly, changes direction suddenly, changes altitude. It's almost scanning for something. 
It's also completely silent. As we watch it, we both have this feeling of dread and fear. The dog also begins to freak out, barking and hair standing up on end. At this point, we run inside and turn every light in our cabin off. We then watch as it continues onward over the lake. As it goes, it stops in intervals and adjusts. Its altitude, up scans forward a few hundred feet. Down scans forward, up scans forward, down scans forward. It does this until it's over the next tree line and out of sight. It took us another hour to fall asleep. We've never been believers, so to speak, in extraterrestrial life or unearthly UFOs, but that pretty much converted us on the spot because it was so scary we were shaking afterward. I'm just glad someone was with me because every time I write this it sounds crazy, but it happened. My husband was hunting alone in eastern Oregon many years ago. He is an excellent hunter, only kills what we can eat and follows the rules. Even as a hunter, he loves the forests and animals and would never kill wantonly. He came upon a man who had two baby cubs of the year on a big rock and was getting ready to shoot them off the rock. Their mother was dead nearby. He tried to stop the guy even though it was possible the cubs might not survive on their own. He asked the guy why he shot the mother bear. It wasn't bear season. No reason. The guy started staring hard at him and asked if my husband wanted to take the cub's place, at which point my husband backed up and got the hell out of there. Later that night, several odd things happened at his campsite, and he felt someone was in the tree as watching him. He got his rifle, his dog, and equipment, and again got the hell out of there. Not a real scary experience, but he got goosebumps for years remembering it, only time he was really scared in the woods. I'm a park ranger, and I've seen some strange things in my line of work, but nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered when I would call to investigate reports of strange lights and eerie sounds coming from a section of the park that had been closed for decades. As I made my way deeper into the park, I could feel a growing sense of unease. The trees seemed to loom closer, their branches reaching out to grab at me as I passed. The ground beneath my feet was soft and spongy, and I could hear the squish of mud with every step. After what felt like hours of walking, I finally arrived at the entrance to the closed section of the park. The gate had long since rusted shut, and I had to force my way through the thick vines and brambles that had grown up around it. As I stepped into the area, I was hit by a wave of cold, damp air. The sky was overcast, and a thick fog had settled over the ground obscuring everything beyond few feet in front of me. I could hear strange noises all around me, whispers and murmurs that seemed to come from nowhere. I pressed on, following the path deeper into the park. As I walked, I noticed that the trees were different here. They were twisted and gnarled, their bark rough and blackened. The ground was littered with dead leaves and branches, and a foul smell hung in the air. As I approached a clearing, I saw the source of the strange lights. A large metal structure rose up from the ground, its surface covered in strange symbols and markings. As I approached, the symbols seemed to writhe and twist, as if they were alive. I hesitated for a moment before stepping inside. The interior was dimly lit, but I could see strange machines and equipment lining the walls. It was then that I noticed the journals and notebooks scattered about the room. As I began to read through them, my heart sank. This place had been a site for top-secret government experiments, and the scientists who had worked here had been studying a form of energy that they called the Dark Force. Their experiments had gone horribly wrong, and they had unleashed something truly horrifying into the world. They had tried to contain it, but it had grown too powerful, too intelligent, and too malevolent. As I read, I could feel a presence behind me, and I turned to see a figure standing in the shadows. It was humanoid, but its skin was a sickly green, and its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. I tried to run, but it was too fast, and it was always right behind me. I could hear its ragged breathing and its low growls, and I knew that it was hunting me. I stumbled through the darkened forest, the trees reaching out to snag at me. 
I could feel the creature's hot breath on the back of my neck, and I knew that it was only a matter of time before it caught me. Just when I thought that all was lost, I stumbled into a clearing. In the center was a small cabin, its windows lit with a warm golden light. I ran towards it, the creature hot on my heels. As I reached the cabin, I threw myself inside and slammed the door shut behind me. The creature let out a blood-curdling scream, and I could hear its claws scraping against the wood. After an hour or two, the scraping stopped. I hesitantly exited and saw that this creature left. I immediately ran for clearing and went to Park Ranger's station. I'm quitting this job. As a young police officer named Harry, I received a call from a park ranger in Ozark National Park. There had been a murder of a hiker, and they suspected something paranormal, but they weren't sure. Being an avid believer in the unknown, I was immediately intrigued and said I would check it out. Once I arrived at the park, the ranger led me to the hiker's corpse. Upon analyzing the body, I concluded that it had been attacked by a bear. But the ranger shook his head, telling me that bears don't leave bodies behind. They eat them. He continued, saying that this was the work of some serious cryptid, possibly a loop guru. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. A werewolf in Ozark National Park. It seemed impossible, yet the evidence was right there in front of me. The ranger told me that the full moon was at night and that I should investigate then. As night fell and the full moon rose high in the sky, I made my way back to the crime scene, alone. As I approached the corpse, I watched in horror as it began to transform before my eyes. The body contorted and twisted, taking on the shape of a monstrous werewolf, and with a roar it lunged towards me before running off into the woods. I was in shock, unable to move or even think. How could this be possible? I had always been skeptical of the supernatural, but now I had witnessed it firsthand. I knew that no one would believe me, and that my career as a police officer would be over if I reported it. I spent the next few weeks in a daze, unable to shake the memory of that night. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't function, and eventually I was committed to a mental asylum deemed too unstable to continue my duties as a police officer. But even in the asylum, I couldn't escape the memory of that night in Ozark National Park. I knew that the werewolf was still out there, roaming the woods, and that it would always be a part of me. I could only hope that one day someone would believe my story and put an end to the monster that had destroyed my life. I was excited when my friends invited me on a camping trip to a remote area of the woods. It was going to be a fun adventure and a chance to disconnect from the stresses of everyday life. But as soon as we arrived, I felt a sense of unease that I couldn't shake. One of my friends, Jake, was of Native American descent, and he warned us about the legend of the Skinwalker, a shape-shifting creature that was said to haunt these woods. But the rest of us brushed it off as just a scary story and didn't take his warning seriously. As night fell, we settled into our tents and started a campfire. We laughed and told stories, trying to enjoy ourselves, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us. That's when we heard the first strange noise outside our tent. It was a low growl, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. My heart began to race as the growling grew louder and more persistent. Jake's face turned white as he whispered, It's the skinwalker. I told you we shouldn't have come here. Suddenly we heard the sound of something scratching at the side of our tent. We held our breath, waiting for whatever it was to make its next move. And then, with a deafening roar, the skinwalker attacked. It tore through our tent with razor-sharp claws, scattering our belongings and sending us running for our lives. We fled into the darkness, trying to find our way back to civilization. But the skinwalker was relentless, chasing us through the woods with supernatural speed and agility. One by one, my friends fell to the creature's attacks, leaving me alone and terrified. I knew I had to face the skinwalker head. On if I wanted to survive, with nothing but a small knife in my hand, I stood my ground and prepared to fight. The skinwalker emerged from the shadows, towering over me with its twisted form and glowing eyes. 
In that moment, I realized the true horror of the Skinwalker legend. It wasn't just a scary story. It was a warning. And now I was facing the consequences of ignoring that warning. With a burst of adrenaline, I lunged forward and plunged my knife into the creature's heart. It let out a blood-curdling scream and collapsed to the ground, defeated. But my victory was short-lived. As I made my way back to civilization, I realized that the skinwalker had cursed me. I could feel its dark magic coursing through my veins, transforming me into a creature of the night. And now, I am the new skinwalker, doomed to roam these woods for all eternity, stalking unsuspecting campers and seeking my next victim. I recently moved to a decent-sized plot of land in northeast Kentucky. I went out to check on the chickens with my dog, Luna. I noticed the chicken coop needs some repairs after the recent heavy winds. Heard some noises in the woods, but didn't think anything of it. Called out Luna and we went inside. Came back out with my tools, and as I'm fixing to starting driving screws in, I hear my own voice yell out Luna from up in the woods. I'm familiar with skinwalkers, wendigos, and the sort, but in northeast Kentucky. I wanted to look at the moon and stars without turning on the lights in my house and the outside lights. I have a lot of floodlights surrounding my house just for the purpose of keeping unwanted entities away, and to feel safe because I also live alone. I was enjoying the light of the moon and twinkling stars and the stillness of the night was standing on the threshold of the house and heard loud flapping. I stood thinking what the heck was making all that noise. I just so happened to look up towards the sound and this large humanoid creature was flying overhead about 25 or 30 feet above me. The span of each wing was as long as his body which I estimated about 6 to 7 feet. The total wingspan was close to 15 feet. It flew over my sister's mobile home. The family always goes to bed early. It was flying north towards Shiprock, New Mexico. I was wondering if this was the same flying creature people see around NAAPI, Navajo Agricultural Products Industry. I got so scared and started locking doors and turning on all the lights inside and outside. I spent a sleepless night hoping it wouldn't come back. Two or three weeks ago, the dogs were madly barking toward the canyon and the arroyo that runs close by. My son-in-law went to check and saw a big black being standing about, I'd say, 60 to 70 yards away. He was walking towards it to get a better look, but he said it disappeared. So far, I've not seen it again. When we were teenagers, a buddy and I were in the woods one night and saw a floating blue light very close to us, northern Ohio by Lake Erie near Cleveland. We loved walking through at night because there were always creepy noises and hard to identify animal sounds. That night we saw this blinking light floating or flying in almost a hook J pattern. It was like watching a lightning bug, but a brilliant blue, almost like an lead. There were no other lightning bugs in season, and certainly no other blue lights. We were very close. It was only a few feet away from us in the dark woods. A bit of moonlight, we could see shadows. Or if there was a person with an lead light, ballsy enough to sit alone and wait to prank strangers that may or may not walk by. You know, in case that's what you were thinking. We watched them amazement and disbelief for a few moments and then heard what seemed like an extremely high-pitched giggle. Again, you little girl hiding in woods at night to prank people. I don't think so, which then we both ran out of the woods as fast as we could. Anyone know of any blue bioluminescent flying giggling insects in North America? This happened to me in July this year, and I've been thinking about it constantly since. I'll try to sum up the experience as best I can. So I'm kind of a mentally ill weirdo. I have BPD and CPTSD, and am a 24-year-old girl who lives alone in the city, just minding my own business. 
I have a few friends, but I'm not close with my family. It's not unusual for me to go a few weeks or months without really seeing anyone besides co-workers, especially during a globalized pandemic, so I've just been doing my own thing. This encounter happened during one of those few week stretches of isolation. I'm only giving this bit of exposition so people can understand my psych history as well as my mental state, etc. So start of July, I got this uncontrollable impulse to go camping and stargaze. I never go camping alone. Haven't been around four years and had no camping shit whatsoever. But I wanted to go for some reason, so I researched some good dark sky spots in Utah, found a cute little campground about four hours into the desert, and reserved the last spot available for a week out from that day. I bought all my stuff the day before and just drove out. I'm horrible at planning and time management, so by the time I arrived at the campground, the sun was already going down. I also had forgotten my charger and realized I had to make my 60% battery last until I could make it back to the city the next day. There was no service out there, so that seemed east enough. My entire goal was to chill in my hammock chair all night and stargaze anyway, so all I needed was some music for that. I specifically chose the night of a new moon for this, so I knew I had to get my tent set up and situated ASAP before the sun went down. There are a lot of others here, but most are families with kids getting ready for bed. Could hear parents reading scripture to their kids before bed. Mormons and could see others reading on Kindles and stuff before sleeping. By the time everything is set up, it's about 10 p.m. Everyone almost at once turns their lights off and passes out. This really weirded me out at first because it was the perfect night for stargazing. I didn't see a single other person setting up a chair to stargaze, any telescopes, or even just someone outside of their tent looking up. Ah, everyone was either already asleep or going to sleep. I gave it some more thought and figured they all probably just want to wake up before or with the sunrise because we are in the desert. Sleeping in wouldn't exactly be a pleasant experience when you're getting cooked alive, I imagine. I work night shift, so at staying up was not an issue in the slightest bit. So at this point, the only people I can see that are awake are myself, this family at the campground vaguely near me reading scripture, in a whole mess of people at the bathroom. My tent is located at the far side of the campground, so to me left is nothing but desert and cliff. In front of me is the bathroom, about 100 feet or so away two other campgrounds, about 300 feet away, and more desert sky. To my right and behind me is the rest of the campground. There's another bathroom on the far side of the campground behind me to my right, which is probably around 700-900 feet away. These two bathrooms are the only source of any light in the campground aside from a few people who are using their flashlights to come to and from the bathroom. Like I said earlier, I'm a weirdo. I won't deny that, which makes honestly telling this story to others hard. So my goal out here was to grieve and to move on from a lot of loss I experienced a year ago. A lot of bad stuff happened in my life and I lost a lot of loved ones as a result. Sometimes a good mushroom trip will really help one find a lot of closure when it comes to grief, so that was my only goal this trip. I ate around 2 grams and was coming up around 11 p.m. Now, hear me out here. What kind of close encounter story can be believed when the person telling it was under the influence of a psychedelic, you might be asking? That's a good question, and I would say that being skeptical of a person's experience under the influence of such drugs is common sense. That being said, I want to say I have a gross amount of experience with psychedelics, some trips in even weirder and more isolated places than this. I've tripped on mushrooms easily dozens of times in my life, and on acid probably over a hundred times. I've kept tons of trip journals, have recordings from trips, etc. Never once has anything like this happened to me before or since. I have never seen things while tripping, have never interacted with entities, have never had thoughts or paranoia about something being there that's not. I always have the same trips, which is some textures get wavy, 
My emotions become full and bright, and I feel at peace in my mind for those few hours finally. That's it. I'm convinced that what happened to me in the desert was not a product of the drugs, but merely happened to me while I was tripping. It would have been the same had I not been on psychedelics, but that's just my opinion. I definitely do invite skepticism otherwise. So yeah, I'm coming up and I'm ready to stargaze. I got a pee though, and all these people hanging out around the bathroom are making me nervous. No one else is awake that I can see now. No lights are on or tents open anywhere around me. The only people still awake are all over by the bathroom. I eventually cave and just head over and do my thing. No one bothered me or said anything to me luckily. I start walking back over to my chair. So my spot is pretty close to the bathroom. I can walk from the front of it in a straight line in the dark and I will without fail hit my tent after about 25 seconds of walking. Because it's this easy, I don't bother whipping my flashlight out to get there. Plus, saving my phone battery for the drive-out is still my priority anyway. I'm walking through the dark when I see the outline of my hammock chair and a person standing right next to it staring at it. I freeze and stare at them. I'm super confused as to why this person is in my camp spot, standing alone in the dark, just staring at my chair. Maybe they are curious about it. I don't know. It's weird, F. I wave at them, but they don't notice, so I move a little closer, and I guess the sound of my footsteps alerted them to my presence cause they shot their head up towards me, took around three steps in my direction, backed up about six steps, flashed a bluish flashlight in my eyes, and fast walked away. From me towards another person I hadn't noticed either, standing in the dark around fifteen feet from us. The both stand next to each other, shining their blue flashlights at their feet and they both move around me towards the bathroom and disappear into the girls' restroom. Weird, right? I thought so standing there all terrified like a dumb bitch. I rationalized that the first person must have been waiting for their friend to catch up or something. I sit down and finally put on some good music in my headphones and just melt into the beautiful show playing in the sky above. It's now around 11.30 to midnight, and there's still people messing around near the women's restroom. It's actually just really distracting at this point and bugging me a lot because it's right in my line of sight. They just keep waving their flashlights around and coming in and out, but they never seem to go anywhere. They will walk out of the restroom, turn their lights off, and just walk into the dark without their lights to guide them. They usually will either walk behind the bathroom where I can't see them, or off to the left side into the dark where there are no camp spot. I notice someone is standing next to me. I tear my headphones out and shoot my head to my right. There is a silhouette of a person standing about seven feet from my chair. I am frozen and spooked pretty bad. They take around two or three steps towards me, then back up again around six and walk around me in a way into the dark with no flashlight away from me and away into the bathroom. Now I'm spooked. I don't think it's anything supernatural right now, but I definitely think it's some people up to no good. The nearest city is hundreds of miles away, and we are far from any civilization out here. If these were people trying to hurt me, they could do it rather easily. I stay in the chair for now, but I keep my headphones off so I can hear the environment around me. My head is now on a swivel, but I'm still trying my best to enjoy the night. Now it's midnight, and no one else is awake. No flashlights anywhere. No voices, nothing. All the bathroom people finally vanished, and it was just me awake as far as I could tell. With my headphones off, I started to notice sounds now. The sound of a jet somewhere near would come and go, flying around somewhere in the desert. I kept looking for its aircraft lights, but could never find them. This deep, almost physics-defying boom would occasionally shake the desert, but in a weird way. When I heard and felt it, I would feel my body tense and shake with it, and the air too, but never the ground. It's weird because it sounded as if it was coming from the ground itself, not the air. I would hear what also sounded like laughter coming from the desert to my left, the portion of desert with no camp spots or people. I'm still at this point just chilling.
I'm obviously starting to suspect some weird shit, but for the most part I'm chilling and enjoying the night. Then, orbs in the sky. I practically shit myself when I saw this. Above one of the cliffs far out on the horizon, this little swarm of glowing orbs had appeared and they were almost dancing around one another. I remember this moment very, very clearly. I remember seeing them, thinking I can't explain that. What the F is that? There is nothing I could imagine could move like that, not even drones. I won't record this, I promise. It would ruin it, and I want to see it through. I remember thinking that last part very clearly out of nowhere, and thought it was weird how specific it was in my mind. I hadn't even thought to record it in the first place as I had just noticed it, but here I was making a promise to myself that I wouldn't even try no matter what would happen. Another cluster of orbs appears in the sky to my right, and almost simultaneously the orbs to my left instantly shoot across the sky to join the other orbs. I start smiling like an idiot. This is it, the thing I have been staring at the sky looking for my whole life. The thing I stopped believing in for decades because I never saw it. I had let the world convince me that it was just as boring as it appeared, and never once allowed myself to think it could actually be more than that. And the proof of that was finally staring me in the face. I had to keep checking in with myself, being like this isn't the shrooms, right? No, it's definitely not. I see that, and I know... I'm not hallucinating, it probably went through that little personal questioning close to a dozen times over the course of the next few minutes. The jet sound comes back and it's much louder now. I can actually see the aircraft lights now too flying directly overhead, but they aren't blinking like usual. They fly into this dark cloud in the sky I hadn't noticed before and vanish along with the jet sound. The orbs continue playing around each other until they vanish too. All in all, I'd say this lasted for like an hour. It's now around 1 a.m. and I really gotta pee. I obviously hold it as long as I can because I am witnessing the single most special thing I'll ever get to see right in front of my eyes, but eventually I break and just want to get it over with. So, I'm a trans woman. I wouldn't even bring that up if it didn't have some sort of relevancy to the story, to be honest. I look and sound exactly like a girl. It's pretty much impossible for people to tell I'm not cis and haven't been clocked in a long time, but I still have a penis. I'm out here in the desert on shrooms witnessing some high strangeness, but I still gotta be careful of what bathroom I use. Normally I would just use the girls, but those people I encountered earlier were still making me paranoid, so I figured if worse comes to worse, I'd rather be caught in the men's in case there are some weirdos out here. I head in there, and I'm doing my thing at the urinal as fast as possible. I zip down and start going. The moment I start the door to the restroom shoots the F open and some guy with short brown hair around five feet six, and a half-sunken droopy face runs in eyes, glued to the ground, and barges into the stall next to me, shutting the door and doing his biz. The only word I could use to describe him was he looked sick. This obviously scares the F out of me. It's like 1 a.m. and I haven't seen another human being in a few hours, and I just saw the light show in the sky, and I'm a cis-looking girl peeing standing up at a urinal, and I'm alone with this dude. He pees for no joke three seconds. That's it, all that rush, all that urgency. For three seconds of tinkle time. Who does that? He spent the rest of his time in there slowly pulling out toilet paper from the roller for some reason. I'm a dumb bee and just held my bladder for way too long, so I'm trying my best to just get it all out so I can leave, but it's taking forever. I finally finish and for some reason go to wash my hands. I don't know why. It just felt like the right thing to do in the moment. The guy shoots out of the stall again way too hard and fast, comes in right next to me at the sink washes his hands for a total of two seconds, and leaves the bathroom as fast as he entered. I'm just kinda shook. But again, I'm trying to rationalize this. I just think he's probably tripping too, and the sight of some girl peeing at the urinal at 1 a.m. probably made him think I was an alien too. So I head out and back to my chair. 
The moment I sit down, the lights in the bathroom, I was just in shut-off all at once. The lights in the girls' bathroom and the boys. No one enters or leaves, either. And now, just a single tiny yellow bulb can be seen glowing above a park ranger's bulletin board on the side of the building. I sit down and almost kind of invite more weird shit to happen around me. The jets are back now and louder than before. There are orbs now huge ring around the campground pulsating and growing, and then dimming, slowly drifting around. And terrified, but also I can't move. It's too cool, to be honest. That's really the whole reason I didn't hide in my tent. Who the F in their right mind would listen to their instinct to run when you could see how far it could go? I hear weirder sounds coming from the desert, what sounds like shouting and a baby crying far, far away. The orbs reappear in the sky and behind the trees next to my tent, it looks like the moon is shining through. But it's a new moon. It's now 2 a.m., the bathroom lights come back on, but only the lights in the men's restroom. The women's remain off, and I see no one come or go. At the point, the only thing that can be heard coming from my mouth the past little bit is, I'm a dumb bee. Why am I doing this? This is terrifying, and I'm dumb for just letting it happen. I'm very aware of my desire to run and give in to the fear, but that is highly outweighed by my curiosity. At least it was. A person who comes from seemingly nowhere, with no flashlight on and no clear intention of direction, walks in front of the bathroom and it's terrifying. Normally, that ain't scary. It's just some person. But, like this person was easily 10, 13 feet tall, the bathroom itself was around 13 feet tallish, and this person walking in front's head was at mid-level with the top ventilation window. They the crown of their head was taller than the building itself. They walked in front of the restroom and into the dark, and I shot out of my chair. The only thing I said was, nope, nope, bad nope, f nope, that's my line, Pope f nope. A few, that's terrifying, nope, f nope, or something like that. As fast as I could, I ran into my tent and quickly zipped it up. There was no not running at this point. My sympathetic nervous system just oil over and was very adamant that I needed to hide. It's hard to describe what I felt, but it was the most primal fear I've ever felt. I have BPD and keeps, so I'm used to feeling a staggering amount of terror in my mind on a daily basis when my symptoms show up. But this was on a whole other level. It was like some deep animal part of me understood the moment I saw them, that I was no longer at the top of the food chain. Another ultra predator, much, much smarter than me, had just made itself known and my body was tending up like a wild animal at the sight of it. I felt truly humbled and small in that moment and knew I was outmatched. They were now outside of my tent and were scurrying non-circles around it. The sound of their footsteps gave way into the feeling of their voice playing side by side my own inner voice. This is where it gets hard to explain. We talked, but talking is not the right word for it. They communicate in pure concept and feeling, and it's so subtle and instantaneous it's hard to describe how obvious it is, while at the same time being so subtle as to almost be indistinguishable from your own thoughts or feelings. The things we talked about were rather personal, so I won't go into it in much detail. I asked them about the jets, whether that was us and if we're trying to find them. They said, yes, I thought we aren't smart enough to find you guys. They said, no, you are smart. You just aren't creative. They said they are scared of us too, but are much more aware of us than them. They want to know us more, but it's hard. Too much complication. It cited me running and hiding as proof. I said, that's natural. I'm still an animal with a nervous system hardwired toward survival. Something new and unknown is going to do that to people no matter how rational they try and stay. They said they liked me because I was honest about the fear. They were scared too. They want freedom and they want that for us too. But they aren't quite sure what to do. Or at least they wouldn't tell me. Whenever I would ask their name or why they were here, they would deliberately ignore me. They also seemed to get a kick out of messing with me, also citing that as a reason for this. They did one thing that I really liked, 
and it was to show me they have always cared and always will. It's hard to describe the feeling they gave me, but it really was unconditional love. They called me family and kept expressing their love for me and told me that I chose this. I didn't get that part all too well. When they said that to me, all these memories flooded in from my childhood, but I'm still struggling to draw any connections. After a while, I of course had to pee again. I did, and nothing happened. I went back into my tent to eat some trail mix and to record an audio recording of what we just talked about so I could remember as much as possible, and noticed the time on my phone said something like 11 a.m., my phone has never messed up like that before and changed the time on me. It was a little validating to see, to be honest. It was very clearly the middle of the night, not 11 a.m. I left the tent and they messed with me some more. More orbs in the trees, lights going off in the bathroom, etc. Eventually 5 a.m. hit and they were gone. The sun came up and I headed home. There's a lot of details I skipped over as this post is already way too long. But there you have it. Like I said, I don't expect anyone to believe me. I invite the skepticism honestly, as I was under the influence of a psychedelic substance. I do have to say, out of the hundreds of trips I've had, I've never experienced something like this before or since. I truly believe that these events happened, and that the drugs were not responsible for their inception whatsoever. What to take away from it, I don't know, but be honest. It was amazing, and I want to meet to meet them again. I am extremely humbled now. I believe in other beings again, and have this sense of family and home in myself I've never quite had before. Has anyone out there met them too? I'd love to hear your story, if so, and to let you know you aren't alone in your experience. They are out there, and they do exist. I grew up in the very rural upper peninsula of Michigan, and there were plenty of people living off the grid up there. The winters are brutal, and any error could equal freezing to death. There was a kid in my middle school who came from one of these off-the-grid families, and he could barely read, let alone speak much, and always showed up dressed in muddy head to tow camel. One day the teacher caught him pissing on someone else's desk, and when asked why he did it, he simply said he wanted to leave his scent. Another time, a girl showed up with a severed deer head in a garbage bag because she wanted to show off her hunt. I live in the lower parts of Michigan in a small township. Around my town, there are little trails you can follow that can lead into deep forest or to act as a quick route to the other part of town. A couple of days ago, I was on the trail to go into the deeper part of the woods. The sun had already set, and I was using my flashlight for lighting while on my bike. I had this sitting area, a tree that's branch resembled a swing. I was putting my bike closer to the tree when I made eye contact, or at least I think it was its eyes, with a creature. I didn't see much of its body, but I saw the face. It had a skull with thickish antlers. I probably stayed in my position for like five minutes until the thing screeched. I bolted it with my bike and returned home. I say possible Wendigo encounter because I'm not sure exactly if it was even a Wendigo. Can someone explain who I made eye contact with? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.